Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martha Macaluso, and I am a myofunctional therapist and co-founder at Manhattan Myofunctional Therapy, LLC. And today we have a wonderful guest, Mr. Patrick McKeown, who is a world leader in butaco breathing re-education. He will be doing part three of a series of the importance of nasal breathing, and he will be elaborating upon rhinitis and obstructive sleep apnea and how butaco breathing can help all of those suffering from these uh, issues. Now, thank you very much, Patrick, for being with us today. It's a true honor to have you again, and I'm gonna send it off to you. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Marta. And uh, what we're gonna do today is we're going to explore the relationship between the nose, how well it functions, and sleep disorder breathing, and tie that in with myofunctional therapy, because of course, nasal breathing is going to be um, a very vital function involved with myofunctional therapy. Mm -hmm. And one, one model that we need to consider is that when we're looking at nasal obstruction is the Starling resistor model. And basically this model states that if there's an obstruction upstream, it can lead to collapse downstream. So basically if the nose is blocked or there's difficulty breathing through the nose, that, create, that can create a condition or create an environment environment whereby it increases the collapsing forces that will take tr place in the throat and of course if the upper airways collapse if the throat collapses and the upper airways is a collapsible collapsible tube um, the individual is going to stop breathing and that's going to manifest as sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea so in the presence of a further upstream obstructive factor the nose will generate a suction force that is a negative intraluminal pressure downstream in the oropharynx resulting in pharyngeal collapse in predisposed individuals. And again, we spoke in session one and session two that obstructive sleep apnea happens when the negative pressure created during breathing is greater than the dilating forces of the airways to remain open. So as air is sucked into the lungs, if there's too much negative pressure in the upper airways and the upper airways aren't able to counteract that negative pressure, it can cause them to collapse. And of course, nose breathing is going to be a vital function there. Rhinitis, people often think about a blocked or runny nose. You know, you see kids with blocked or runny nose and people don't really pass on it much common. Mm -hmm. they, they don't pass that much comment about it. You know, it's just seen as one of these innocuous habits. Mm -hmm. But if we have rhinitis, if we have any kind of defect in nasal breathing, um, it increases the, the risk of sleep problems by twofold. Um, so there's a huge relationship between people with hay fever people with nasal allergies, or even people with chronic rhinitis, that it's perennial, that it's continuous throughout the year, and how it affects their sleep. And I think a lot of these people would have just accepted that they're tired, and that's the way they are, but they don't consider how should the nose be operating. So data on nasal congestion history and sleep problems. So here is a questionnaire that uh, 4,927 questionnaires, and also objective in laboratory measurement. And the patients who reported nasal congestion due to allergy were almost two times more likely to have moderate to severe sleep disorder breathing than those without nasal congestion due to allergy. And this is where breathing education will come in because it's very easy to teach somebody how to decongest the nose. Um, we simply hold the breath and the exhale. And we hold the breath until you feel, you know, a medium to strong air shortage and then let go. And we repeat that five to six times. And at that point, then the nose will be temporarily decongested. Mm -hmm. But the whole key to having a good nose working is to breathe through it. Mm -hmm. If we breathe through an open mouth, the nose is more likely to get blocked. Mm -hmm. If we breathe through the nose, both in and out through the nose, the nose is more likely to remain open. And the reason being there is because as we exhale through the nose, heat and moisture is trapped on the expired air. And it's this heat and moisture that will contribute to the nose staying open. So people who often talk about breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, well, it's going to increase nasal congestion. And one study showed that if, for instance, you breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, the loss of heat from the expired air, that it did contribute to nasal congestion, and it took 10 minutes before the nasal congestion was removed. In other words, that normal breathing volume normal breathing through the nose was restored. So it's quite a significant influence there. Mm -hmm. The other thing about breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth is that there's a 42% greater loss of water by breathing out through the mouth. 
and it's the loss of mo moisture. Again, we need moisture to be retained by the nose because that's going to help it stay open and help it function properly. So it, it, this is quite a remarkable study. Now, we wouldn't expect these results at all just by switching to nose breathing. Uh, it was conducted by Fitzpatrick et al. And it's at a Belfast hospital. And they found it obstructive, but not central apneas and hypopneas were profoundly more frequent when breathing orally. So the index, the AHI index is 43 by breathing through the mouth. And by switching to nose breathing, it reduced to 1.5. And that's a phenomenal result, wow. you know. Um, now, it's not one that we would say that we could produce, but we can say absolutely that when you switch to nose breathing, it's certainly going to help the AHI index. Mm -hmm. And they found that the treatment of nasal obstruction was associated with a dramatic and sustained reduction in nasal resistance. And the amount of time that was spent with the mouth open during sleep was reduced by 30%. So improvements in sleep architecture were observed during active treatment and there was a modest reduction. And the one question that I'd have here with this paper is that if you treat somebody's nose, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll actually breathe through it. I think it's very important to, you know, if you go through the nasal treatments, whether it's buteco method, um, whether it's antihistamines, whether it's nasal steroids, whether it's surgery, whatever you do, it's very important that you breathe through it. And I use my own personal experience because I had nasal issues for most of my life. Mm -hmm. I had an operation on my nose um, in 1994 to help with breathing through it, and nobody ever told me to breathe through it. So I spent the next three years after that continuously mouth breathing. So in many ways, the operation, I would have considered it a failure because even though it improved my nasal breathing, I just wasn't using it. Mm -hmm. So there's countless people going through the same procedures and I think it, it's really important that myofunctional therapy is brought in here to help people make that switch because if you spend 15 or 20 years with your mouth open, you're not automatically going to suddenly switch to nose breathing and there's a process involved there. There's an increased awareness and also exercises to help restore nose breathing. Yeah, and we're better in the brain, I believe, right? Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. So new neural pathways will form the brain so the good habits form, uh -huh. um, or at least the bad habits will be eliminated. And the same happened in this clinical. This is a study here whereby they looked at nine trials. So it's kind of a small meta-analysis. They looked at nine, nine trials, and they, the trials involved external nasal dilators, which would be something like breed right strips or... Mm -hmm. the turbine or mute and um, they used external nasal dilators in five studies they used steroids in one nasal decongestants in two and surgical treatment in one study and they found that chronic nasal obstruction seems to play a minor role in the pathogenesis of obstructive sleep apnea and seems to be of some relevance in the origin of snoring and again you know for me this doesn't add up because here's nine clinical trials looking at the effectiveness of what happens when we open up the nose, but it doesn't mean that nasal breathing is restored during sleep because again, fixing the, fixing the, the, the problem, but not addressing the habit. And mm -hmm. I think it would be a totally different result if these individuals in all clinical trials, if they were taught and shown how to breathe through their nose during sleep. So this one here uses kind of a novel approach and one that we've been using for many, year, many years. Um, it's tape, paper tape across the lips during sleep. And I've used it myself and I continue to use it. And now there's a new product coming out. It's called Lip Seal Tape. So it's invented by a dentist. Um, I think he's in Colorado. His name is Dr. Frank Seaman. And it's tape that you put across the lips to keep the lips together. So the 30 patients with mild sleep apnea the AHI index was between 5 and 15 events per hour. So in other words, they had either that amount of apneas or hypopneas. In other words, they stopped breathing between 5 and 15 times, or there was a significant reduction to airflow, which is a hypopnea, which lasted for more than 10 seconds. And it would cause an oxygen desaturation of about 3 to 4%. So they were, they were mild. And they slept using the, the paper tape. And the Epward Sleep Scale, which is a questionnaire that's often used for pre-screening for obstructive mm -hmm. sleep apnea. Uh, before the tape, it was 8.1, and after the tape, it was 5.2. So it came down almost to the point, if it went down to 5, um, no, sorry, 8.1. So it came down quite significantly. The Visual Analog Scale there came down from 7.5 to 2.4, which is quite, quite a 
a significant reduction. Mm -hmm. And the median AHI index, the apnea hypopnea index score was significantly decreased from 12 to 7.8. So it reduced by 33%. I think this is a real enough figure. You know, we've already, we've seen that myofunctional therapies will reduce it by 50 to 60% reduction of mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. Um, just getting them out closes by 33%. Absolutely. And if, if you were to combine that with reduced breathing, you know, in terms of reducing the negative pressure as air sucked into the lungs, you know, who knows, but it's just something that has to be studied. Absolutely. So I want to show you um, an exercise to decongest the nose, and it's very, very simple. So I'll talk, talk your listeners through it so they can be practicing it. Mm -hmm. Basically, you take a small or normal breath into your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, and you pinch your nose with your fingers, and you gently nod your head up and down, and you hold your breath, and you keep holding your breath until you feel a medium to strong air shortage, and then to release to breathe through the nose, and to calm the breathing. So after you release, then it's important to bring breathing down as quick as you can. And then we wait a minute and we do it again, wait a minute, do it again, and repeat it about five or six times. Now, I do have to say that that actually helped doing it just right now that one time. Sure. <laughs> I was a little congested myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's, it's amazing how effective, like the kids even can take to it quite easy as well. You know, they think it's magic because how it works, we're not entirely sure. But there are some papers showing that it could be the increase of carbon dioxide in the blood. Um, because as you hold your breath, carbon dioxide builds up in your blood because you're not getting rid of it through the lungs. You're not breathing it out. And it's a bit of CO2, which opens up the nose. So breath holding and physical exercise will always open up the nose. Now, could it be that as you hold your breath, nitric oxide sharply increases inside the nasal cavity? And that could be happening. Or could there be a change in heat? So there could be a number of different factors happening, but we, we know it works, and we've had it studied at a local hospital in Ireland, and rhinitis symptoms reduced by 71% at three-month follow-up. And by simply decongesting the nose, switching to nasal breathing, using the nose, and then slowing down breathing volume. So very, very simple tools. I'll just go through it again so that your listeners have a second chance to try it. It's to take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, you pinch your nose with your fingers, and they hold the breath, and it's holding the breath until you feel a relatively medium to strong air shortage. So you need to hold your breath for, you know, until you feel a medium to strong air shortage. And when you really need to let go, is to let go, breathe through your nose, but then calm your breathing immediately. And calm your breathing. Before, you know, if any of your female listeners are pregnant, I just say, you know, don't do it, refrain from doing it or if people have high blood pressure, or kind of any serious medical complaints not to do it. But other than that, you know, it's, it's relatively safe. We hold the breath any time we go for a swim, for example. Um, how many times do you see a child and they're swimming in a swimming pool and they swim down to the bottom, they pick up a penny and they bring it up. So it's a very natural thing for human beings to do. Um, and here we're talking about holding the breath during the day to open up the nose, as opposed to stopping breathing during sleep, which is an entirely different thing, um, sleep apnea. So, you know, it, it's, it's based on that. But yeah, so I think that ties in nicely with where we are at the moment. And we leave it at that because the next session I want to look at is the relationship between asthma and obstructive sleep apnea. And we can talk about that and go through that link because there's quite a lot going on there. There's a huge link between sleep disorder breathing and respiratory complaints. You know, the link, why is there such a link between asthma and obstructive sleep apnea? You know, Normal, the risk of obstructive sleep apnea is probably about 20 to 30 percent of the Western adult population. But with asthma, it increases to as high as 90 percent. Wow. And as asthma, as asthma severity increases, so does obstructive sleep apnea. So, in our second, or sorry, in our fourth session, I want to look at that link to see can we uncover what's going on there? Because I believe that there's something we can learn um, from looking at asthma. Why? When asthma increases in severity, so does OSA. There's some relationship there. And defining that relationship will provide some feedback or some clue as to what's really going on with obstructive sleep apnea. So we leave that. I'll pass it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Patrick. It's, as always, an honor to have you here with us. Um, now, we know that butaco breathing can help a lot of people, um, yes. as we've seen with your segments also. Um, so, and decongesting the nose naturally. So, 
Can you tell us a little bit about, a little more about um, how buteco breathing can help with uh, asthma? And um, I know we're going to go into asthma and OSA in our next mm -hmm. segment, but mm -hmm. who can benefit from buteco breathing? Sure. Traditionally, buteco has been used for the treatment of asthma. Um, and many people with asthma have rhinitis. So uh, probably most of the people who have attended for the last 15, 20 years would have been coming initially for asthma. In the last five years, more people are coming in with sleep disorder breathing. The relationship between heavy breathing or hard breathing and how it's contributing to snoring and OSA because the Buteco method is about two things. It's about learning to breathe through the nose and it's about learning how to breathe lightly or breathe less. And that's really what it's about. How it's about slowing down the breathing volume to reset the breathing center in the brain so that breathing is lighter. And if breathing is lighter during the day, it's also going to be lighter during sleep. Mm -hmm. If you listen to somebody, the breathing of somebody who's snoring or somebody with an obstructive sleep apnea, you'll notice that it's quite heavy. And what we're saying is that it's the heavy breathing that's contributing to it. And I think this also is the link between asthma and OSA. So we have 16 clinical trials looking at the efficaciousness of the Buteco method with asthma. Um, and all of the clinical trials have been positive. You know, typically kind of results are a reduction. If I used a matter hospital trial in Brisbane, that was the first trial, a reduction of symptoms by 90%, sorry, a reduction of symptoms by 70%. So that's 70% less coughing, wheezing and breathlessness. A reduction in the need for rescue medication by 90% and a reduction in the need for inhaled corticosteroid by 49%. So that was in three months. And that, those results have been replicated in a number of trials ever since. Uh, most recent one in Canada in 2014, it was by Cowie, and that showed that asthma control improved from something like 40% to 79%, which is a tremendous result because a lot of the time, if you were to look at the asthma population, many of those individuals, they don't have their asthma under good control. So generally, it's accepted that 40% of the asthma population have their asthma under control, and 60% their asthma is not under good control. So Buteco improves it from 40 to 79%. Um, so most recently, I've been involved with two clinical trials for children. This is where sleep ties in because they looked at asthma, but they also looked at sleep. You know, these kids with, with asthma, they have sleep difficulties, sleep disturbances, they're tired during the day, and of course, their behavior is affected. So they looked at the parameters involved in sleep, and those parameters improved. So those two studies are due to be published. They've been submitted for publication, mm -hmm. and we hope to see them published in the next few months. So it'll be exciting looking at it because we still need a lot more research in terms of looking at the relationship between breathing and sleep. Absolutely. And I think it's, I think it's going to happen. You know, I think the link is, is too strong um, that it, it can't really be ignored any longer. And I think the more people practice it, and realize the benefits of nose breathing and the benefits of changing their breathing, you know, because when you realize the benefits and when you experience it, it's going to propel more people to try it. And it's on the back of that then that clinical trials will start happening as a result of it. Absolutely. And I also feel that this has become like a major public health concern as well, sure. linking the mouth breathing with a lot of different um, illnesses as well. So it's very interesting and important um, you know, to know about buteco breathing and that there are some options out there that are natural mm -hmm. and that actually uh, can help. So thank you so much, Patrick, for being with us today. Sure, um, thank you very much. Looking forward to part four. And don't forget, don't forget to check out Patrick's book. It's uh, The Oxygen Advantage, which is one of his newest books. And it has a lot of great information on breathing re-education. And uh, it's a true treat to be able to read that book and learn so much from the world leader in Buteco Breathing Re-Education. Thank you so much, Patrick. And uh, looking forward to part four. Thank you so much, Martha. Okay.